Winston Churchill said, the positive thinker sees the invisible, feels the intangible, and achieves the impossible. Zig Ziglar said, people often say motivation doesn't last. Well, neither does bathing. That's why we recommend it daily. I hope we've said something over these lessons in the last few days that has encouraged you and that has motivated you. I can say beyond uh, the shadow of doubt that you've encouraged and motivated me. I've heard good things about the church here at Buford. I've seen that those things are so. And you will all be in, in my thoughts and in my prayers in the days and weeks to come. Uh, I'm already looking forward to my next return trip here, which supposedly is next month. Uh, there's a preaching conference with the Jenkins Institute called Better, and that's going to be taking place on a Monday and a Tuesday, I believe. Uh, those of you that don't have to be at work or have to be at school should come out and join us for that. There'll be some interesting folks there, and that's always a good time. I've appreciated being there, but uh, we'll be praying for you, that you continue the good work that you're doing here. There was a song featured in the 2014 The Lego Movie that struck a chord with a lot of people. Written by a collaboration of composers, it was produced by a character by the name of Mark Mothersbaugh. Now, some of you are thinking, well, I've never heard of Mark Mothersbaugh. You have, you just don't know it. He was the lead singer of a little outfit from Ohio called Devo. Remember, whip it, whip it good. They had the pots on their head. Anyway, um, but the song was performed by a Canadian sister duo, Tegan and Sarah. The song was a breath of fresh air, maybe as much for the title as the song itself. Everything is awesome. As a nominee for the Best Original Song at the 2015 Oscars, they performed it at the 87th Academy Awards. In the spirit of this song, a couple of years after that came out, uh, I was made aware of a book that was written by a Canadian blogger by the name of Neil Pasricia, titled The Book of Awesome, it was written by Pass Risha in an attempt to get over his divorce and the suicide of a close friend. Uh, he was going through a rough patch, and his frustration with the doom and gloom of the nightly news caused him to set out to highlight some of the simple, overlooked pleasures of life. One thousand of them. If you go through the book of awesome, you'll see the 1,000 awesome things that Pasricia has decided to spotlight. Publishers Weekly said, Pasricia emerges a committed but inviting optimist, combating life's unending stream of bad news by identifying opportunities to share a universal high five with humanity. Isn't that a nice thought, to share a universal high five with humanity? Now, we're not going to share all thousand of those because, you know, we got to eat lunch here in a few minutes. But a few of my favorites in going through the book are as follows. The first scoop out of a jar of peanut butter. Why is that better than the second scoop or the 200th scoop? It just is. And you get in there, and I get that spoon, and I feel like I'm Lewis and Clark discovering the northwestern United States. How about that moment at a concert after the lights go out and the band comes on stage? And you're not quite sure what that first song's going to be, but you know it's going to be pretty good. How about this one? When your favorite sports team is in the nationally televised big game. That was the last time we'd won a national championship, way back in 1997. I still had most of my teeth back then, a long time ago. But uh, I'll tell you this, we got a family at Pinnacle in Little Rock. They moved from Augusta, Georgia. In fact, the dad 
was one of the chief groundskeepers there at Augusta National, a little course where they play the Masters. And he got three little kids, the littlest one, about knee-high to a chicken, and man, he's got a big mouth. I mean, this little dude is a Georgia fan, Georgia this, Georgia that. So Michigan now has been in the college playoff three years. Well, the first time we got in three years ago, we were slated to play Georgia. And I'd made a mistake getting up in the pulpit. I said, we're going to turn Georgia every which way but loose. And that little guy said, Georgia's going to whip your behind, which I'm not sure you can say behind in church, but I just did. And guess what? He was right. Georgia whipped our behinds. I mean, it was like the men versus the boys. It was like the bully taking the little kid's lunch money in the schoolyard. It was, it was rough. Uh, so I was glad this year that we didn't have to fool with Georgia. We just had to deal with those punks from Alabama. Sorry, Ben. <laughs> Um, but you know, it was our time. So, you know, you keep knocking on the door, eventually the door's going to open. How about this one? The smell of the coffee aisle in the grocery store. I didn't start drinking coffee until I was the tender age of 37. Now, I've been drinking it since then like it's going out of style, but even before I would drink any coffee, I love smelling the coffee in the grocery store. It's just a good thing. How about this one? The back seat car windows that go all the way down. Not half of the way down. When this country was great, the windows went all the way down. And you could sit in the back seat and you could do this. And I'm the only one that I, I love. I still like doing that. I do that sometimes in the front seat. The sound of steaks hitting that hot grill. You, you can taste it right now, can't you? That, that, that's good. When the dog is really excited that you're back home. I have had a great time here. I appreciate all the, the camaraderie, the hospitality, the friendliness. I'm looking forward to going home. Um, my wife and I are now empty nesters, but we got two dogs. We got Mavis, the 45-pound terrier, and we got Murphy, the 15-pound miniature golden doodle. And they are... They're just marvelous. I'm going to hit that back door tonight, Lord willing. When I open that door, those dogs are going to jump up and down. They're going to spin around in circles. They're going to lick me in the face. And it's going to be a, a, a wonderful, tearful reunion. I asked my wife one time, I said, hey, you know, not for nothing. Why don't you greet me like that? She said, <laughs> she said you're pushing your luck, little man. So there was that. Another thing that's awesome, the school field trip day. Now, here they're going to a museum, and that's good. It didn't matter where you went. Did you notice that? You could show up to school, and the teacher said, Class, we're now going to the sewage treatment plant. You're like, yes, okay. That's, that's, because whatever you were going to was better than what you were going to have in the classroom that day. How about dinosaurs? You know, people ask the question, why do little kids like dinosaurs? Because they're awesome, that's why. I mean, who wouldn't like dinosaurs? Except I'm glad they're not walking around today. You know, people say, well, you know, birds are dinosaurs. Really? I never had to worry about a bird coming up behind me and swallowing me in one bite. So, you know, to me, birds are birds and T-Rexes. Well, you know, that's another uh, genus, species, or phyla. Flying over mountains. A few years ago, uh, we got to go to London and then we made a quick uh, trip to Rome and then flew back from Rome back to London. I liked Rome. I liked flying over the Alps better than I liked anything in Rome. Seeing those things from the air was spectacular. You know, the Lord's built a pretty good uh, world down here. It behooves us to see it from time to time. Another thing that's awesome, hibernation. Bears have figured something out, okay? There are a few months when you're just better off going in a cave and sleeping. We're in that time right now, okay? I mean, I know some of you, we're not going to name names, but as that cold weather settles into Georgia, you know what you're going to be doing? You're going to be under the covers, or you're going to be wearing flannel or something, and that's all right. You're just doing like your cousin bears do. Here's another good thing. Fixing electronics by smacking them. Hey, anybody remember that? I always wanted to do that, never could. So the next best thing my wife told me when the phone's not working or the iPad, she said, I was like, hey, this isn't working, Sue. What do you do? Turn it off, 
turn it back on. Yeah, that works 90% of the time. Some of you tech geniuses can explain why. I just know that it works. And another thing that's awesome, Pastor Risha talks about becoming a regular somewhere. That little old man right there with all the hair is my father. If you, you turned around, you can see he's wearing a Michigan shirt. He wears Michigan shirts most of the time. But we had a, a coffee clatch that meets on Fridays with some of the brothers in the church. And that was at Dunkin' Donuts. We're now at another place. But every time he'd go in Dunkin' Donuts, they'd know what he would order. I want a small coffee, black, and a glazed donut. And that's what he would get. But reading this book, and I would encourage you to read it. This isn't, you know, it's not war and peace or anything. It's pretty easy, breezy and all that. But you'd read about a thousand really cool things that you hadn't even given much thought to. And I guarantee you it will bring a smile to your face. So reading this book got me to thinking about something that was related. What are some of the often overlooked simple pleasures of being part of God's church. I don't mean the obvious blessings like the greatness of God, forgiveness of sins, and having Jesus as our Savior. Those are Mount Rushmore things. I'm talking about things that if you weren't careful, if you weren't thoughtful, you might miss them. Here are a few of those simple pleasures that I think we have in churches of Christ that we would do well to contemplate from time to time. One is simplicity. Simplicity. The church, at its essence, is simple. It's not complicated. We don't have any denominational headquarters, uh, even though those people in Searcy, Arkansas, think that they are the headquarters. They're not. Um, but the church doesn't have any denominational superstructure or anything else. It's just simple. Uh, Longfellow said, in character, in manner, in style, in all things, the supreme excellence is simplicity. You know, kind of like the debate of books versus Kindles. The basic, simple thing will never go out of style. I'm a bit of a, of a bookish type, and about everywhere I go, I take the Kindle with me. I like that because I got about 2,000 books on here. But you know something? You got to power it up. You got to charge it up. I heard someone say something I thought was rather foolish. They said, you know, in a few years, books will completely disappear. No, they won't. You know why? Because they work. They're simple, that's why. And some people say, well, you know, in a few years, the church might not be here. Nonsense. Acts 2.42 puts it better than anyone could. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in the fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and prayer. At its core, at its essence, the church of Christ is simple. We worship God, we commune together, we teach and preach and practice the same thing that the early Christians did. And in the restoration movement, the notion is to restore early Christianity. Now, some religious historians uh, take shots at us and they call us primitives. And they don't mean that as a compliment. Well, guess what? It actually is a compliment, because what it is saying is that we're simply trying to be Christians. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. If you had never heard of us, if you'd never heard of me or the elders or the preacher, and you picked up the Bible and you did and practiced what the Bible teaches, what would you be? You'd be a Christian. That's simple. And that works. I pray that we never become so sophisticated that we're not satisfied with the simplicity of New Testament Christianity. Here's another blessing about being a member of God's church. Authority. We just heard the scripture read from Matthew chapter 28. Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Where do we find our authority in religious matters? Where do we find our blueprint for what it is that God has called us to do? In 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17, the Bible says, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, 
correcting and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Do you realize some of the controversies that are besetting our religious friends and neighbors? They're trying to figure out what to do about this and what to do about that. And uh, I know the Methodist Church, for instance, uh, where we are in Little Rock, there are churches leaving uh, the Methodist Association left, right, and center. And it's over LGBTQ things. And they're trying to vote about, well, what should we do about this? What should we do about that? That's one thing in Churches of Christ, for the most part, we don't have to fool with. You know why? We're going to do what the Bible says. The Bible says it, that's what we're going to do. We're going to speak where the scriptures speak. We're going to be silent where the Bible is silent. And the authority in churches of Christ is not in preachers. It's not in elders. It's not in a vote of the membership. It's what does the Bible say. That's our authority. It should always be that way. We should never substitute anything else for that. A third blessing of belonging to the church is honesty. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 25, Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. Some of the most honest people I've met in my six de decades on this planet have been fellow Christians, brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, does that mean everybody in the church is honest? No, I could give you a few names of people that aren't. I've run into some over the years, and maybe you have too. But think about the big picture. Most of the folks you've known in, in the church, are they honest? Yeah, they are. Most of the folks you know in the world honest? Eh, some are, some aren't. Uh, I, I was over at a, one of our members. She's uh, 89 years old. And she's got Alzheimer's, and she's kind of struggling. And I was visiting her at her house. I'd taken her one of those Danish Kringles. That's one of those Yankee treats that you Southerners probably don't know about. They make them in Racine, Wisconsin. It's this giant Danish. And it's so good that when you take the first bite, your knees buckle. It's, it's fantastic. But I, I take those every December to our widows and some of our shut-ins. So I was over at Sister Jean's with one of our elders, and we were taking one of the Danish Kringles to her. Well, Jean's deaf as a stump, and she's too cheap and too vain to use hearing aids. She won't use them. I'm the only person in the church she can hear. I got a big mouth, and I usually speak into the microphone. Everybody else, they, one of the brothers is up there, ah, I can't hear him, speak up, one of those kind of things. So we're over at Jean's house, and we're eating the Danish Kringle, and she would made us some coffee, and the phone rings. Now, I know what this phone conversation consisted of, because she got the thing turned all the way up, and she got it on speaker, and there was some clown that called in, and he is posing as her grandson. She got three grandsons, and I know them all, and this guy is not one of them. But, oh, yeah, this is your grandson. Well, where are you? Well, I've had some problems here, and uh, I, I've been arrested with a traffic accident. I'm following this whole thing, and you know how this ends, okay? And I need some money. And she, well, uh, and she's kind of, she's got Alzheimer's, okay? She doesn't really know what's going on. I said, Gene, give me that phone. I went over and grabbed the phone. I said, hey, I said, this is Gene's preacher. You ever call here again, I'm going to get the cops on you, boy. And he hung up immediately. Now, the moral of the story is this. Not everybody out there is honest. You know that. People, by the way, that are bilking senior citizens out of money, there's a special place in hell for those people. You know that, don't you? I mean, I mean you're going to go ahead and take advantage of an old lady with Alzheimer's. God's going to go upside your head at the appropriate time. You just need to know that. But think about what you've seen in the church. Most of the folks here... You could set your watch by them. That's how honest they are. It always should be that way. We've got to tell the truth to each other. The church has to be a repository of honesty. Number four, we've got diversity as a blessing in the church. Now, have we done exceedingly well in that? No. 
Our country hasn't done exceedingly well with that, but I'm thankful to see that the ice is melting and that progress is indeed being made. Ephesians 2 and 14 puts it this way. He himself is our peace, who has made the two one and tore down the dividing wall. Well, is the dividing wall down completely in the United States? No. Is the dividing wall torn down completely in the church? No, unfortunately. But here's the thing. We can do something about that here and now. Where I preach at the Pinnacle Church of Christ in Little Rock, we're doing something about it. We are setting out in every way to making sure that that congregation is for everybody. Young, old, rich, poor, black, white, native, immigrant, whatever. We want you here. The church is for all. Now, that hasn't always been that way because old attitudes and prejudice and racism, those things are hard to eradicate. They exist deep down in the human heart, and you've got to push back on those things. But if you look at Ephesians chapter 2, this is what you see. Two groups of people in the first century who were both interested in the gospel of Christ, were not always having the easiest time coexisting with each other. You see that in the early chapters of Acts. You've got the Grecian Jews and the Hebraic Jews. And there was a controversy that they thought that some of the widows belonging to the Grecian Jews were being ignored, that they were being neglected. So the apostles stepped in and said, look, Choose seven men from among you, full of wisdom, full of the Holy Spirit, and handle this situation. That's the way that we've got to deal with those kinds of things. You show me a church that's all white, or that's all black, or that's all anything, and I'll show you a church that's incomplete. I'll show you a church, they're not hitting on eight cylinders, they're hitting on two cylinders, because the church was made to be one. It's made to be a place for everyone to be involved. What does it say about Jesus? He took of the two men and made them one new man. He tore down the dividing wall that was keeping people apart. If we're going to be faithful to the call of Jesus Christ, we better start practicing the diversity that the New Testament preaches. Number five. We've got the practice of humility in the Lord's church. As God's chosen people, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. I went from preaching at one of the ten largest churches of Christ in the world to starting up a congregation that didn't even have a building. We had to rent three different spaces. For five years, we rented an old, decrepit roller skating rink with a wooden floor. And I had several people come up. When I was a teenager, I used to roller skate here. You would be amazed at how many people do not want to go to church in a roller skating rink. They just don't. I mean, it's not, this isn't even really a church. What are you guys, like in a tent? You're going to start handling snakes next? I mean, what's going on over here? If you're a church, you'd have a building, right? Well, for five years, we had a roller skating rink. But here's what I found out that happened. That was kind of like a screen. You remember when God was getting ready to thump the Midianites upside the head in the days of Gideon, and they got an army and 10,000 people, and the Lord's like, no, too many. Well, get rid of some of them. Okay, we got rid of some. Get rid of a few more. Get rid they end up with 325 people. Well, that's about what we ended up with at the roller skating rink. Well, now we ended up buying a, a used building, and we put some lipstick on that pig and fixed it up, and things are going well. But this is one of the things that I've noticed. You kind of separate the hoity-toity from the regular blue-collar working-class folks when you got to deal with stuff like that. And I'm saying that to you guys. you got a really nice, tastefully appointed building. I don't know why you don't have any windows, but that's not for me to... Uh, <laughs> I'm meddling and not preaching now. But, but here's the thing. 
you find out what we are when you start doing without certain things, right? You know, guess what? You know, it wasn't the nicest building in the world, but it was okay. You know, we had a good microphone. We had a, a screen for pictures, and we didn't have any classrooms, but our people were just grateful to be the church, to help people, to serve, to worship, to do all the, the simple things that we've seen New Testament Christians doing forever. There was a great story that one of the old Bible teachers at my alma mater, Oklahoma Christian, uh, taught, Hugo McCord. And this is what he said. He said, years ago in a coal mining community, long before union wages, a Christian man worked 10 hours a day for $2, taking home each Saturday night the sum of $12. That was his pay for the week. He had a devoted wife and two small sons. They invited me for a Sunday dinner. They only had four chairs. The father sat on a nail keg, giving me his chair. On the table was a dish of mashed potatoes with two hot dogs cut in inch lengths stirred into the potatoes. There was a jar of home canned pickles and a plate of corn pone. That was all. The father said that they were too poor to have a nicer dinner, but, quote, I wanted our sons to remember that we had a gospel preacher in our home. That visit to this day is unforgettable. Although I've been a guest at the White House in Washington three times and was made to feel welcome by Mrs. Roosevelt, who said to me, you don't eat like my boys. The invitation into that coal miner's cabin is the most precious invitation I've ever had. One of the things I appreciate about the Lord's Church is that when we're doing what he asks us to do, well, we turn out to be humble people. Because guess what? We've got a lot to be humble about. And finally, it's a blessing of the church because we've always understood the inevitable end to which everything is moving. Hebrews 9.27 is likely tattooed into your brain as it is into mine. It is appointed unto man once to die and then to face the judgment. Since I've been old enough to have any kind of a conscious recollection of anything, I've understood that truth. Because I had parents, I had teachers, I had elders, I had deacons, I had preachers that instilled that truth in my mind. I've understood since I've been old enough to understand anything that this life is but a dress rehearsal for the life to come. This world is just getting us ready for the world to come. You do understand that a lot of people in the world, an increasing number, they don't see it that way. I read this from an author by the name of T.C. Boyle a few years ago in the New York Times. He said, so just dying slowly, not getting hit by a meteor? My dear fellow, we all put our heads down, don't we? In previous generations, there was purpose. You had to die, but there was God, and literature and culture would go on. Now, of course, there is no God, and the species is imminently doomed, so there is no purpose. We get up, we raise families, we have bank accounts, fix our teeth, and everything else. But really, there is utterly no purpose except to be alive you know that that's wrong. There is a purpose. We are heading for something. And the church has always done a good job in reminding people it is appointed unto man once to die and then to face the judgment. I hear critics all over the country lampooning the church, ridiculing her, mocking her, encouraging her to change and to get updated with the times. What that usually means in the minds of a lot of people is we've got to shelve biblical distinctives and we've got to start practicing denominational practices. 
nothing could be further from the truth. The church is a beautiful institution for this reason. It derives, it thrives, and it survives because of Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Not because of us, but because of Jesus. And I hear brethren that they want to change the name of the church. They don't want to call it the Church of Christ. They want to call it something else. And I'm thinking the best thing about the Church of Christ is Christ. The worst thing about the church is me, okay? Let's go ahead and emphasize Christ and de-emphasize the imperfect followers who are wearing his name. But when we consider one thing, this is what I would like to leave you with. In the same way that when Jesus started to teach some things that were difficult to accept and followers started to walk away one by one, Jesus turned to his disciples and he asked a question. He said, do you want to leave too? You remember what they said by way of answer? Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. My friend, the Lord has the words of eternal life. The fact that he has brought us into his church, his forever family, is a blessing that if we spend eternity... We'll never completely understand how great that gift was. As the apostle says, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. I've had a lot of really good things happen to me in my life. I came up in a good family. I lived in a good town. At least it was a good town then. I've watched a lot of good football games and basketball games. Had a lot of good friends. Got a wonderful wife, I got two wonderful sons, three grandkids I'm crazy about, more friends than I can possibly spend time with. You know what the single greatest blessing I've ever received in my life? Being part of the church of Jesus Christ. There's not a blessing that even comes close to that. It is the greatest blessing that God can give his creation. That is, he's bringing a lost and sinful humanity back to himself that God added to their number daily those who were being saved. My friend, if you're here today and you're not yet one of those saved, through faith, repentance, and baptism, God can take you, forgive you of your sins, give you the gift of the Holy Spirit, and place you within his church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against that church. If you are a Christian but you've allowed other things to creep in and diminish and water down that commitment. Today can be the day that you come back to the Lord, that you're restored back to fellowship with him. Whatever the spiritual need that you have, Jesus is ready, willing, and able to fix whatever has gone wrong, to bring you back to himself, and to make those things that have gone wrong right again. If his invitation is calling to you, we invite you to come to him. Won't you respond as we stand and as we